Today, I'm going to describe to you my own evolution as an education activist. Today, a lot of people know me from my postings about education policy issues in Facebook, from my blog with a Brooklyn accent, and by the new organization I founded four months ago, the Badass Teachers Association, which now has 31,000 members of all angry teachers. But uh, 10 years ago, people knew me as a scholar of African American history whose specialty was social movements and popular culture. And I became involved in education activism because of history projects that I was doing in Bronx schools, which were the most exciting educational ventures that I had ever been involved in, which were systematically pushed out of the schools by excessive testing and by rating schools and teachers on the basis of student test scores. I saw a tragedy unfolding before my eyes that I had to speak out about, and then I discovered it was not just the Bronx and communities like it, that this tragedy was spreading all around the nation, and teachers were being demoralized by excessive scripted uh, learning modules, and students were being made to hate school. So I want to briefly tell you my story, how I became involved in public schools, and then how I was pushed out and forced to speak out. It all started in the spring of 2003 when a number of community leaders around the Bronx asked me to direct an oral history project that would recognize the contributions of African Americans to the development and history of the Bronx. Uh, there have been many books written about the Bronx, all of which spoke about the Jewish, Italian, uh, and Irish contribution to the borough, and then abruptly stopped when blacks and Puerto Ricans moved in as though they were an element of contagion which destroyed these beautiful neighborhoods. Also, the people who had done African American history in New York had done it all about Harlem and Brooklyn. So I had a community anxious to tell its story, and community institutions which wanted to hear it. It was the most extraordinary experience of my life. People stepping up and asking to be interviewed about their experiences growing up in Bronx neighborhoods. Some were teachers, social workers, some were ex-professional athletes, some were musicians, some business people. And an extraordinary story emerged. In the 1930s and 1940s, the Bronx was seen by people living in crowded Har Harlem neighborhoods as a place of opportunity and hope for their children, uh, a place where they could find better schools, better shopping, bigger apartments, less crowded streets. And there were three parallel migrations, one of African Americans, the other of West Indians, the other of Puerto Ricans. They all moved to these largely Jewish and Italian neighborhoods, and for a time, the Bronx became the most integrated single place in the United States. Morris High School, whose most famous graduate is Colin Powell, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, was the most integrated high school in the United States. And I had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Vincent Harding, uh, the civil rights historian, who was the valedictorian of that school in 1948. It was a whole different picture of the Bronx that I got. And one element of it particularly captured people's imagination, the amazing music that was being produced there. Everybody knows that hip hop started in the Bronx, or if they didn't, they should. Uh, but what people didn't know is in the 1940s and 50s, you had this incredible music of different cultures. You had jazz, especially bebop. You had Afro-Cuban music, especially mambo. And you had urban harmonic music, especially rhythm and blues, you know, and the doo-wop singing, all in the same neighborhoods, all with these musicians cross-fertilizing each other, amazing music clubs, theaters, and the schools at that time had great music programs. So the Bronx in the 40s and 50s produced more varieties of popular music than any place in the United States, if not the world. So after two years, I'm saying, oh my God, this is amazing. And some reporters from the Daily News got a hold of it and started writing articles about it. All of a sudden, I started getting contact by people in Bronx schools. This would be so great for our students. They have this negative image about the Bronx. So I started first giving lectures to social studies teachers. 
Uh, then I started doing t musical tours of Bronx neighborhoods playing all the music, some in vans, some with my boombox. Um, and then they started inviting me into the schools themselves to give talks. Now, this changed my life because it's one thing to talk to the teachers, it's another thing to talk to the students. Imagine me coming, the old white guy coming into a Bronx high school. So I discovered if I started rapping, they would listen to other things. So some of you may know the song, The Message. I started doing this. Rats in the front porch, roaches in the back, junkies in the alley with a baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far because a man in a tow truck repossessed my car. Don't push me, because I'm close. They looked at me. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. So I started getting invited to rapid graduations. Uh, you know, I mean, and they, they gave me the name, Notorious PhD. And then the most amazing thing happened. I got invited to train the staffs of 13 different schools to do community history projects over a period of two months. It, the teachers, the principals, the lunch ladies, the security guards, and the kids all embraced this. It was the most amazing experience of my life in these 13 schools. Uh, they ended up producing films, dance festivals, plays, food festivals, uh, photo exhibits, exhibits of material culture where they brought their tickets of their grandparents when they flew or took the boat over, platform shoes from the 70s, any of you still have them? You know, uh, old record players, the most amazing experience of my life. And one school, PS 140, which is in the Morris Anus section of the Bronx, the poorest section of the Bronx, they actually created an old school museum devoted to the historical traditions of the neighborhood. These teachers and principals and parents and kids went so far beyond what I had ever imagined could be done with my historical research. I don't know if any of you are historians, but we're used to boring people. No, or or be only being read, the idea that thousands and tens of thousands of people are taking what I was doing and transferring it into lived experience that brought communities together, most amazing experience of my life. And this is in 2006. One of the things that happened is I was the uh, chair of the arrangements committee of the uh, American Historical Association uh, of the Organization of American Historians, I actually had a group from PS 140 perform an old school jam at their convention. It was the only thing that got into the New York Times. So this is like the best experience of my life and within two years, shut down. Why? Because in 2007, New York City Department of Education uh, decided that it was going to give letter grades to schools largely based on student test scores. And as a prelude to deciding which schools needed to be closed and which principals needed to be pushed out. Now, that's a questionable concept to begin with, but when you're the ratings are wildly inaccurate, that's even worse. My wife is in elementary school at PS321 in Brooklyn which is widely considered one of the top two, three best elementary schools uh, in the city. They got a grade of B. But PS 140 in the Bronx, the best inner city school I had ever seen, got a grade of C. What? I went nuts. But it kept getting worse because what happened was after the letter grades, these were all published in the paper. The city began closing schools with low grades, firing half the staff, uh, and ending up in what they call the rubber room, and replacing them with either new public schools or charter schools. And what began to happen was the demonization and demoralization of some of the best teachers I had ever met in my life. Most of the teachers in the Bronx schools came from working class families. Many were black and Latino. Many had grown up in the same neighborhoods that th they were teaching in. Almost all were women. And they were attacked regularly in the press as holding back uh, the country's economic competitiveness, as being responsible for education inequities 
And I couldn't stand seeing those wonderful people attacked. So I wrote an article on my blog called In Defense of Public School Teachers, explaining that experience. It went viral all over the country. Somehow, through the internet, it got around. Teachers contacted me and told me I had to speak out. So I began talking about education issues with more and more information. I spoke three times in Washington, first at the Save Our Schools March, then at two organizations by a group called United Opt Out. And the more I found out, the more horrified I was. Some of the things I started to see were not just happening in the Bronx, they were happening all over the country. So here's what started to happen in the Bronx. First, when schools were being closed, then when the city began publishing teacher ratings, which were based on as much junk science. We started seeing teachers on medication for anxiety attacks. And we started seeing schools so panicked about what was going on that in a place with the highest obesity rates in the country, they were canceling gym and recess for test prep. So this to me was child abuse. Now, I thought it was just the Bronx, but I became, in, there was a huge test revolt in New York State uh, last April because of the, they uh, had common core aligned tests that were so difficult that huge numbers of students felt humiliated. And I began to see some of the same symptoms I saw in the Bronx. Teacher depression and anxiety, student humiliation. And I want to read to you a letter that I was given a week ago about one child in the Bronx named Kyle, named Kyle, not in the Bronx, in Long Island. Kyle is a seventh grader this year. Kyle's mom says Kyle has always had difficulty mastering core subjects, but his grades have been passable. He is brilliant in some things. She says he can put together a part or take apart anything. He has fixed TVs and can repair anything around the house. At school, while his grades remain mediocre in core subjects, he excelled in band and tech. The only way he could get Kyle to come to school was because of band and tech. Well, pa this past September, the school advised Kyle's mom that because Kyle did so poorly on the assessments he is mandated to, to attend double periods of math and English, they took the place of band and tech. Kyle's mom called me crying, not knowing to do, because now Kyle is refusing to go to school. Ladies and gentlemen, this is happening all over this country, in suburbs, in cities, in small towns. When we deluge our schools with tests and rate teachers and schools on the basis of test scores and spends huge amounts of money on this testing and assessment, we push out the things that children love, and we humiliate and, and, and undermine the love of learning in our children. And we're destroying the teaching profession and driving out the most committed teachers. So what I'm asking you is to look closely at what's happening and see what you can do to make school a place where teachers want to work and students want to attend. That's my talk, but I have to end with a wrap in tribute to the great teachers and students and principals who made me understand what it was possible to do in a public school and which now we can't do. So this is my notorious PhD wrap. I have my beatboxer. Here it goes. They call me notorious PhD. I don't wear bling, I spit history. I come to the BX from the BK. MCs know that I don't play. You may be shocked to see my face. The words I say don't match my race, but the jams I bring you are hardcore truth. They'll make you rock from floor to roof. I may be old, I may be white, but my flow is funky and my rhymes are tight. Thank you very much.